So I hope you're enjoying our project and we're going to go ahead and do day two now. And I'm going to go through some things first and then I'll take you through continuing with the application. So we're going to talk about the HTML5 canvas, how we do random numbers in JavaScript, a little bit about the arc geometry and how we implement uh, the arc to draw circles in our application. Uh, a bit more about polygon geometry and trigonometry, how we figure out the points so when we draw an arbitrary polygon, we can figure out where the XY coordinates are and how we implement that. Then we'll go on and add these elements to the code. In fact, what I'll do is I'll break off so it's not really boring for you. So after we do the arc, we'll go ahead and implement it. Okay, first, just a little bit more about the canvas. So we create the canvas with an HTML5 element in the HTML markup. It starts with the canvas tag and it has a closing tag. And then within the tag, we have the attribute ID, which is the name of the canvas element, the width and the height. Although you can actually have multiple canvases, canvas I, I don't know, on your screen, uh, we're only going to have one here. Uh, the 800 is in pixels, and those are the little points that make up the display. Um, so the important thing here right off is the size is made in the markup, not the code, the JavaScript code, and that we give it a name called panel, which we use later. <clears throat> in the JavaScript, we're going to have a canvas variable and we'll use the document.getElementById and we'll pass the ID panel in and this will create a programmatic handle so now I can use this to get information about the canvas and I can also use it to get the context that I want which we're going to call G2, Graphic2. This is a 2D context uh, although I don't know much about it, it's possible to get a 3D context now in HTML5 with the canvas and do what's called WebGL programming, which is three-dimensional. So we're just doing two-dimensional programming uh, here in this application. We can use the canvas.width and the canvas.height to give us the size in the JavaScript code. And of course, that's going to be whatever we specified here in the markup. And all through this application, I'll leave it at 800 by 800. That seems to work well for uh, creating the greeting cards and posting them on Facebook and sending them an email messages and things like that. Okay, uh, I'm assuming that you've seen Cartesian coordinate systems already in your algebra classes. And so in those systems, we have this thing called the origin, which is in the center of the screen. And uh, it has X and Y axis. And the x and the y axes uh, have a value of 0 at the origin. So the center point is 0, 0. This is not how we do it in computer systems. Almost every computer system uses a coordinate system where the origin is up here in the upper left corner. And then as we go across the screen from left to right, the x increases. And as we go down from top to bottom, the y increases. And so basically you can think about this as going x from 0 to canvas.width, which is 800 here, uh, or y0 going down to canvas.height, which is 800 here. Okay? So here's a better view of this. So again, my coordinate x0, uh, y0 is in the corner. My x increases to canvas.width. My y increases as I go down uh, to canvas.height. Okay, so that's how our coordinate system works. Now, sometimes when we do uh, certain kinds of operations, it's helpful to change that. And we can do that with a uh, translation. And what we do is we uh, translate the coordinate system. And so often when we do that, like when we're going to draw a polygon, we'll translate the coordinate system to make the zero point the center point of the figure we're drawing. And so you'll see that in the code for several of the figures that we do that. And when we do that, so it doesn't screw up the rest of the drawing, we uh, save and then restore the graphic context. So all the uh, 
graphic primitives and the functions we use to draw use this sort of programmatic handle to the graphic system called the context. And we get that from the canvas. And so in the code, I always call that G2. And in the methods where we pass that in, it's called context. So we get this at the very beginning. We don't change it again. We'll have that and we'll use it throughout the code. Okay, uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about are random numbers. So one of the things that makes our greeting card app really interesting and gives it an almost infinite amount of variety is that we use random numbers to generate the parameters. So when we draw figures, they are, are located at random positions on the screen. Uh, the user can specify the width and the height, but that's actually the maximum width and the height. And so then we randomize some value within that range. And that's how we get a lot of uh, uh, variety here in this. We also randomize things like how many points a polygon should have, or how many segments to draw, things like that. So in JavaScript, we have a math library function called math.random. And that returns a random number that starts at zero and is just less than one. So that's actually a floating point number. So it's always going to be a fractional value. And then I'll use a multiplier to get me uh, the range. So if I multiply math.random by six, that's going to give me a low value of zero when math.random returns zero. So zero times six is zero. Or the maximum that math.random can return is just less than one, which means I'll get a value just less than six. And then we have another function called math.floor that rounds the number down to the next lowest integer. Uh, there's also one called math.seal, which is short for ceiling, which rounds up. But we don't use that too much. We're using the floor method. So if you look at this expression here, math.floor, and then inside of it, math.random times 6, that will give me a range from 0 to 5, because math.random could be 0, so that times 6 is 0. And then the most that math.random can give me is a little less than 1, which is 5 something, but then when I floor it, it'll round it down to 5. So that gives me a value from 0 to 5. Now, if I want a, zero, a value from 1 to 6, I take my expression, math.floor, math.random times 5, which gives me a 0 to 5 range, and I just add 1 to it and shift the whole range, and now it's 1 to 6, just like a 6-sided die. So these random numbers use linear probability, which means roughly that the chance of getting any one value is the same. Uh, the other kind of probability we have is called Gaussian probability, and we use that in statistics a lot. That's where we have a tendency to have numbers in the middle of the range. So if you have like an average score, um, you're going to have basically really extreme outliers of 0 to 100, and then your average would be in the middle around 50. With linear probability from 0 to 100, we have the same chance of getting any number. So what we're using here is linear probability, not Gaussian probability. OK, let's just look at a few things we can do with random. So it turns out that the way I make colors are with red, green, and blue components. And they have a value from 0 to 255. So if I say math.random times 256, that gives me one of the three needed components. So I could say R for red equals math.random times 256, then the green and the blue, and then I pass them to a color function that generates a color based on the components. Uh, if I want to randomize a location on the canvas, I say math.random times canvas.width. So that's the X that runs across the screen. And then if I want a random Y, which is going to run up or down, I take math.random times canvas.height. So the random is very useful, and you'll see it a lot in the uh, code here for the application. OK, now let's start to talk about our arc. So an arc is a portion of a circle. And uh, you can see here that 
Uh, here's the JavaScript function, g2.arc xy radius start end counterclockwise flag. G2 is our graphics context that I talked about before. So all the graphic functions are methods that G2 has. So we're going to always call that. Inside the methods, where we pass the context in, we use the word context for the parameter. So it will either be context.arc or g2.arc, depending on if we pass the value in uh, to an external method. Now the arc is part of the JavaScript for the canvas, so we don't need to write our own method to draw this. And now let's talk about the parameters. So again, I mentioned that arc is a portion of a circle. XY is the center of that circle, and the radius is the radius of that circle, okay, which is the distance from the center point to the points that lie on the circle. I assume you probably know this. Then we have a start and an end, which are in radians. And then we have a counterclockwise flag. A flag is going to be true or false. So if it's true, the circle will be go like this and be counterclockwise. If it's false, then it'll be clockwise. Now, if you're drawing a circle, it doesn't matter uh, if it's counterclockwise or not, because you're going to draw the entire circle. If you draw part of a circle, though, then it will matter which way you draw, okay? All right, uh, now, one thing I want to mention here is that start and end are in radians, and most human beings are more used to talking in degrees, but radians are pretty easy, and we'll talk about that in a second. All you have to remember is there are two pi radians in a circle, and so here in the JavaScript, math.pi is the value pi. And then 2 times math.pi means an all the radians in an entire circle. So what this says is draw an arc with a center point at xy with the given radius. Start at 0 and go around a complete circle. And then don't make it counterclockwise, but draw it clockwise. Okay? Now we need to talk about the start at zero part, and we'll look at the radians again here in a better uh, diagram. So here's a really great image that I got. It's from an HTML5 Canvas tutorial that's on the web, and I'll put together a uh, set of references for you if you want to learn more about these things. Uh, also, you should probably already know that I have my own YouTube videos that go into more detail too. And uh, as we go through, I'll suggest ones that you might want to watch before uh, each session of our project. So uh, it turns out that the zero point for the uh, arc is right here in the uh, east. Uh, and then basically the two pi radians will go all the way around like this. And so you can see that half a pi is a quarter of the circle. And 1 pi is half of the circle. And then 1.5 is 3 quarters of the circle. And then 2 pi is all the way around. So if you start here at 0 and you go 2 pi radians, it's going to go all the way around. OK? Now, um, this is a little strange to me because in most graphic systems, the 0 point is north, not to the east. But this is the way. The HTML5 canvas does it, so you just have to remember that. So uh, one thing to, it's important here is the first value is an absolute one, where to start. <clears throat> the second value is where to go from there, okay? So it's going to basically, if I start anywhere and I go two pi radians, it'll do a complete circle, okay? All right, let's talk a little bit more about the radians. Again, you don't have to worry about converting between radians and degrees. Just remember that there are two pi radians in a circle, and then do everything in radians. So if I want half a circle, I say 1 half times 2 pi radians. So 2 times 1 half is 1, which means it's going to be 1 pi radian. And we saw that on this last diagram here, where 1 pi radian is, in fact, half a circle. Okay? 
Uh, similarly, if I want a quarter circle, that's one quarter by two times pi radians equals one half pi radian. Now, if you want a certain number of degrees, let's say for instance we want to draw a pentagon, that's uh, 360 divided by five, which is 72 degrees. And then to get that into radians, we say 72 divided by 360 times two pi radians. And that's very simple to do. So you don't have to really worry about converting between radians and degrees. Honestly, I didn't have to do this. I already figured out that I want a, a five-pointed figure that's 72 degrees, but I could just do one-fifth as well, right? So one-fifth times two pi radians to find out how many radians there are between each segment in um, my pentagon, okay? All right, let's go ahead and uh, code the arc now for our app, and we'll come on back to this presentation. So uh, let me go ahead and just uh, end this and minimize it. And uh, basically now I've got this open, so I have my day two start code. So what I did is I downloaded the zip file for today. Now if you were here yesterday and you didn't have any problems, instead of using this new code, you can go ahead and use your code from yesterday. Okay. So uh, basically what I've done is this is my working directly and I have a day two folder and I either copied the code from day one here or I just downloaded it. So now I'm going to zip into the zip file, open it up, copy the code out, back up in and right click and paste it. And so now there's my day two start code folder. So I can get rid of the zip file. I can leave it there. It's not going to hurt anything. But uh, if I don't want to get confused, I can delete it. But I'll leave that for you. Okay, now I'm ready to open the file in NetBeans. So I'll minimize this. I've already got NetBeans open. You should know how to do this. We're going to say File, Open Project. And then uh, it's, I'm going to have to go to my working directory here. So it's looking at the drive where I've been working. I should have set that ahead of time to save time. So I'm going to go ahead to go here and then to my working drive, which I'm calling Ursula Scratch. Oops, what's going on? There we go. And then I want the day two folder for today. And you see the little HTML5 icon? That shows me that NetBeans recognizes that that's a project. So I'll go ahead and open the project. And if I come over here, I can see my site root, and here's all my files. So my index.html file, which I'm going to need to edit today, and my script file. Let me go ahead and change the size of my text so it'll read better for you. Uh, I just printed the code out so I could use it as I did this coding, and I made it a little smaller than I like on the screen. Uh, you don't need to do this. You probably can read the code fine at this size on your monitor, but uh, for the video, I want to go ahead and change this. So I go to Tools, Options, Fonts and Colors. Over here, it's set to 18, and usually for the videos, I set it up to 24. And so we'll hit OK, we'll hit Apply, we'll hit OK again. And now you can see that my code uh, is bigger again and a little easier to read. Okay, so we're going to add the uh, circle to our <clears throat> greeting card application. Let's start in the HTML, so index.html. And uh, if I slip down here to where I have my figures, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a little frog in my throat today. Maybe some coffee will help there. I hope it does. There we go. Okay. So you see here with this div, it says Fig Selection. These are our uh, checkboxes for our, um, you know what, I forgot. Before I go into this, I wanted to show you where we should be today. So let's run our app. So we'll go up here, I'm going to tell it to use Firefox, and then I'm going to hit the green arrow to run the application. And it should show Firefox. So here's my greeting card app. This is what we did yesterday. So I have my line and rectangle for yesterday. 
real quickly just to make sure that it works. I'll select both of those. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and jack the size up to 400. Again, the, the canvas is 800 by 800. So 400 should be okay. It's set for 20 figures. Let me go ahead and change the background color real quick. So I'll pick that light yellow. Uh, hit OK. Then hit Clear. And that puts the background on there. And then uh, I'm going to go ahead and click Draw. And it'll draw the 20 figures. And it'll randomize between the line and the rectangle. So we'll hit Draw. There's my rectangles and lines. I can hit draw several more times to get more. So that's what we did yesterday. The rest of the functionality is already there. So if I want to do text, I can go ahead. Let's make this uh, 50, which is a little bit bigger. I like the Comic Sans, so I'm going to leave it. I'm going to go to the fill color. And uh, what's a good color here? Uh, let's go ahead with a real light color for the fill and then give it a black background here. So that's actually the default. So I'll just hit OK. And then I'll go ahead and put in a little message. Hello, students. I hope you like computer programming. All right, there we go. We'll go ahead and hit our text. Then I'll put the text on the card. There it is at the top. Now I'm ready to save this message. So I'll go ahead and click Save. It tells me to go ahead and right click and save the image when it pops up. There's the image. Right click. And then I can save image as right here. And uh, I'll go ahead and what am I at here? It just picked up a random directory I was at earlier. So let me go back to my uh, working directory for Ursula there. So working and then Ursula Scratch because this is the directory where I actually do my scratch work and then copy as I go. So there we go, Ursula Scratch and I'll just hit save. Uh, I can give it a name too here. Uh, sometimes it comes out as download and sometimes it comes as index depending on what browser you're using. So uh, how about uh, hello students day two. So this is day two. There we go. All right. And then I can just go ahead and close this and I'm back in the app. And I could continue and work from here. Um, I could clear this and do another or I can reload the page. OK, that's good. So let's close this. And sorry about that, I forgot that I wanted to show you where we were at. So now we're going to go ahead and add the circle in. So I'm in the HTML, and you see where I have this uh, rectangle here. I'm going to copy that just to save time. Control C, and then I'll go on down to the next line. And Control V, I'll paste it in. And now I'll just change it. So I want to change this to circle check. And then I'll change the name of the actual checkbox, circle check. And it's important that I get it right. So I'll have to look at it carefully here. So circle check is the ID for the checkbox. The label is for the checkbox, so it has the same value in the for there. And then um, this, of course, is the display. And I'm going to change that to circle instead of rectangle. OK? So we got that. And we can actually see that really quick if we run our app again. So now you can see that the circle has been added. Now, it doesn't do anything yet because I have to add the JavaScript code for it. So now I'm going to go back over to my JavaScript file. And I'm at the very top of the file. And the first thing I have to do is I have to add the uh, constant for circle. And uh, maybe this is not good, but I'm kind of keeping these all short like this. So I'm going to call it circ. And then this has to be 2. Now, it honestly doesn't matter what numbers you use here, but it's sort of smart to make them continuous. So each time we add a new figure, 
we'll add a constant for it and we'll just keep adding the number there. Okay? All right, now I'm going to go down into my code. And in the draw function, I have this code that looks to see which figures uh, the user has got. So if you look at this code that I have highlighted here, this is jQuery notation. It basically says, find the thing in the HTML called the line check, which is the checkbox. If it's checked, see the if? If it's checked, then add the line to the set of figures that we're drawing. So when you call the drawing function, when you click the draw button, it does that. It quickly scans the page to see which figures you've indicated you want to include in the drawing, and it adds them to this figure set. So you can see up here, figure set is empty. It checks to see if I've checked the uh, line checkbox, and then it adds line to figure set. And then it checks to see if I've added the rectangular checkbox, and it adds that to the figure set. So now I want to do the same thing for the circle. So I'll go ahead and add and copy and paste this in. Again, Control C to copy, Control V to paste. And now it's not rectangular check, rec check, it's circle check. And then uh, basically now I'm going to push my constant on there, and that is circ. So uh, now I just have to add the code to actually draw this in. Okay, I'm going to hit Control S to save my file. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and cruise on down here. And by the way, remember we talked about random today, so now you can kind of see. So here we get a random X, Y. Uh, on the width and the height of the canvas, and uh, that's how all those. So you can kind of look at those on your own if you want. We're going to use all of those eventually, and I just left them in the code instead of building them as we go. Okay? All right. Uh, so we're in within the draw function, and basically uh, this code here generates a random uh, element or index into our set. So remember we were looking at figure set? So this is math.floor, math random, figure set dot link. So what that does is that takes a random value from zero to just less than one and modifies it by the number, multiplies it by the number of elements that are in the set. So let's just say now that I have uh, three things in the set. I have line, rectangle, and circle, which I checked. So the math.random times 3 will generate a value 0, uh, 1, 2, and uh, actually it's just less than 3. So if I use the math floor to round that down, 0 rounds to 0, and then I have 0, 1, or 2, and that's the values for Oh, you know what? I made a mistake. So 0, 1, or 2 is uh, the uh, element in the figure. So right now, as I mentioned, I've got three things in the figure. So 0 is the first thing, 1 is the second thing, 3 is the third thing. And then it turns out that what those three things are, are the line, the rectangle, and the circle. Okay? Uh, they might not be. Later on, when I have six or seven uh, elements, you could just select one or two of those, and they wouldn't be in order. So, for instance, right now I have three. I could just select the circle. The figure set would have one element in it, and it would be the first element, and the value of the first element would be uh, the circle. So I get a little confused there. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, grab our case here. So we have to put a case in for each figure as we add it. And again, you did this yesterday with rectangles, so now we're just doing it for circle. So let's go ahead and paste the code in. It's always smart to uh, edit your code and keep it uh, nice and straight like this so you can read it better. Okay, this is going to be circ. And then uh, now I basically have to uh, let's go ahead and uh, remove this for now. And now I'll put the code in to draw the arc. So that's going to be G2 
which is my context, arc. And then as I start to draw the arc, I'm going to do uh, the center point, which is x and y. And then the radius, and that's called radius in the code. Okay. And then we just saw this before. So now the start point and the end point. So because we're drawing circles here, we're going to start at 0 every time. And we're going to draw to 2 times math dot pi which is the number of radians and I think oh and then we have our final thing which is the flag it doesn't really matter here if we say true or false uh, that's to draw counter or counterclockwise since we're drawing a whole circle we won't be able to tell so we'll just make that uh, well let's make it false so we'll draw clockwise okay then a semicolon alright now um, that's going to draw the arc but the thing is, I have to uh, go ahead and draw it. And so uh, this is difficult to explain. So when I call the draw method, it actually creates the figure, but it doesn't render it. And so when I render a line figure, I use stroke, like I did up here for line. And when I'm dealing with a figure that uh, is uh, got an inside and an outside, it's, it's a 2D figure, then I use the fill and the stroke. Okay. Now, fill rectangle and stroke rectangle are specific for those. But here, I'm just going to use the more general fill and stroke. So G2 dot fill. Oops, where is that? I might have to check my notes here. It seems like I'm missing something. So let me really quickly consult my notes. Sometimes old Tom forgets things here. So, oh, here we go. So, yep, yeah, that's right. I had it right, Phil. And so what that'll do is that'll draw the inside of the circle, and it'll fill it with the fill color which we randomized in the code above. So now we're going to draw the outside of the circle and we do the stroke to do that. Okay? So again, it's kind of weird, but basically the G2 arc command creates the circle, but it's not rendered in what we call fill and stroke. Okay? All right, we should be able to test our code now. So let's go ahead and run our code. It's always good to do that. You work incrementally. You make a few changes, test the code, then make a few more. Now, this time, I'm not going to select anything but circle. So I'm only going to draw a circle. Uh, I'll go ahead and make this 500. And I think I'll also click the fade, which should make them fade. And I'll make the first circle have an opacity of 90%. And then from there, it'll fade as I go. And 20 should be a good number. So we'll go ahead and draw. And whoops. Oh, you know what? I forgot to refresh. Let's see. All right. Uh-oh. I got an error. So I'm going to have to figure out what I did wrong here. So hang 10. Okay, so uh, I just turned the video back on. I had a little bit of a problem there. It's not related to what we're doing, uh, but I had destroyed the variable for the fade when I created the code for today. And so when I kicked the fade in, it caused an error and it didn't work. So we got it working now. Uh, I've got it set to 400. Go ahead and do 20 figures. Uh, and now the fade actually will work. It won't cause it to error. So now when I click draw, it'll go ahead and draw my circles. Okay, Just to show that it's still working, let's go ahead and draw uh, everything else. So now we're getting circles, uh, rectangles, and lines. Okay, And you can see that it's using the uh, opacity value. So that, uh, And that makes it more interesting. If you just draw them at 100% uh, opacity, then you, you know, it just isn't as interesting. Everything's on top of each other. Okay, so that's good for that. Let's go ahead and uh, close our browser here real quick, and we'll go back into the PowerPoint.
That's kind of funny. I found that bug, but that goes to show you um, how things work when you're doing the programming. So it took me a few minutes to figure that out. Okay, uh, I think we talked about the radians. Here we go. Let's pick up right here. So now we're going to talk about the polygon, and then we'll go ahead and implement that. Uh, the polygon code is just a lot more code. It's not particularly hard. It's just there's more code. So uh, it might be a little tricky for us to get the code typed in correctly. I was kind of surprised when I first looked at the JS canvas that it didn't have a polygon method. Uh, but it turns out that it's not too difficult to write your own. So in all the previous methods that we've done, uh, the figures that is, we've used methods that are written already for us. So we used the arc to draw the circle a few minutes ago. We used the uh, uh, fill and stroke rect to draw the rectangles. And then uh, we used the uh, line to, to draw lines. So uh, we've written our own method here, and it's called polygon. It takes the graphic context, which is going to be G2 in the outer code, the center for the polygon, which is XY, the radius, which is the distance from the center to the points of the polygon, and the number of sides. And it turns out that the number of sides is also the number of points, which are called vertices. Okay? All right, here's how this works. This is the geometry of this. So we're going to draw the polygon in relation to its center point. And you're going to see in the code that one way we do this to make the code easy is we translate the center point. And when we do that, it makes that the 0, 0 point. So then this becomes like the coordinate geometry you learned, where this center point is at 0, 0. Okay? One thing that we should do, do is just kind of look at what we're trying to do here. So you know that if I have a polygon on the same center point and it has the radius that's the same as this circle, its uh, vertices are going to lie on the circle. And so we're going to take advantage of that here as we figure out how to draw our polygon. So uh, basically I have to use some trigonometry here. I know the hypotenuse of my triangle, and you see the triangle here? That's actually going to be the radius. Now here in this diagram, it says R equals 1. That's called a unit circle. Let's ignore that. And in, instead of R being 1, it's the actual radius of our figure that we're going to draw. So basically what we need is we need to get the x and the y coordinate here of this point, which is one of the vertices of the triangle. And uh, that's basically going to be using the cosine and the sine. So you can see here that the sine is this distance from that. That's the height, which is the y. And then the cosine is this distance across from the x-axis and, uh, excuse me, from the y-axis. And that's the width or the x. So if this angle here is theta, the sine of theta gives us the x, and the cosine of theta gives us the y. Did I say that right? No, I just said that backwards. I'm sorry. The sine of theta is the y. The y is the vertical component. The cosine of theta is uh, the x, and uh, that's the uh, x. Damn it, I have it wrong here in the slide. I hate when that happens. Uh, let's fix that real quickly here. So y. And x. My students always laugh when I do this in class. All right. Uh, from current slide. There we go. So sorry about that. So the sine of x gives us the y, which is the vertical component. And then the cosine of x, uh, excuse me, of theta gives us the x, which is the uh, horizontal component. Okay? And again, theta is the angle. All right, let's look at how this is going to work in our code. So the angle is going to be 2 times math pi, that's a complete circle, divided by how many sides we have. So that gives me my angle. 
And then this context.translate xy says make xy the center now. So it's going to remap xy to the 0, 0 point. That's going to make the calculations easier. And what we'll do, in fact, is we'll save our graphic context. So we'll say g2.save. We'll go ahead and run this translation and do all the mapping of these and draw everything out. And then we'll restore the context. So the translation will only affect drawing the polygon. It won't affect the rest of our drawing code. OK? Now, to go to the first radius, we're kind of cheating a little here. And so basically, I know that the, uh, if I set the first vi uh, <clears throat> If I set the first vertex so its y is 0, then uh, the radius is going to move out on the uh, y, y uh, axis, and it'll be where x equals radius. So you know what? I got this wrong, too. It's not straight up for the center. It's actually straight to the right to the east. Uh, having a day of it here. So straight to the east, OK? Uh, let's save that and from current slide again. OK, did you see that? So if y is 0, I'm on the y-axis. And then I move out a uh, radius number for x. And that puts me, let's go back to that, that puts me right here. So this is the first point that I start at. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And then I'm going to use this for loop. And notice how the loop starts at 1 for the point number 1. So point number 0 is really here. And I've moved to it already. And that's this point on the circle. And then as I go through, I'll calculate the new and the x, x and y for each vertice. And that's going to be angle times V. So V starts out at 1. So this is angle. So again, it's here. And it goes down to the first point, then the second, third, etc. And it goes around the circle like that. And when I get to the last point here, it, it, which is this one. So I'm drawing the line to those points. So I move to the first point, which is on the y-axis. Now I draw to the next draw to the next, draw to the next, however many I have, and I'll be at the last point. And then I use the closed path, which is a graphics primitive from the context that says, oh, you wanted to draw a closed path with a series of segments. So that automatically draws from where I'm at, the last point, to the very first one, and that closes the polygon. Uh, it's pretty amazing. I had this stuff in my head and I got it wrong. <laughs> so uh, I actually kind of fixed it as we went. I'm going to leave that in the videos. It's good for you to see how we do problem solving and do these kinds of things. Okay, now we're going to go back and put the polygon code in. So let's close the PowerPoint. We won't be back to that. And um, I need to get back into my NetBeans. Good, there we are. Okay, let's go back into the HTML. And you can see here where I just added the circle in. I'm going to go ahead and copy that circle code, Control C. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Control Z to undo that. And then paste in the copy with Control V. So here's the circle I just copied. Here's the copy. I'm going to go ahead and change this now. And this should be polycheck. Polycheck. And then the name here is also polycheck. So this says this label is for this checkbox. And the name of the checkbox, the ID, is polycheck. And then, of course, instead of circle, now this is polygon. OK? Hit Control S to save that. Real quickly, if we want, we can check and make sure, but it's kind of unnecessary. But now you can see that it's got the polygon in there. And of course, it won't do anything again until I get the code in there. All right, let's go on over to our script.js file, or JavaScript. Go all the way up to the top. 
add the polygon in. So var poly equals three. Cruise on down here again, and now we'll add the check code to check and see if the user wants us to do poly. So we'll grab the code that we just put in there for circle again and copy it. Control V, paste it in. And then go ahead and just pretty it up. And now come in here and change this. So this is poly check. And so if poly check property checked is true, then that means push not circle, but poly into our figure set. Okay. Now we'll go on down into the drawing area. Now this is going to get a little hairy because we have to do a function here as well. So let's finish uh, this code first here uh, for the case. But, and it's going to call the polygon drawing function. But we're going to have to um, add the function code itself in. Okay. Uh, let Tom check his notes because this one's a little bit more complicated. So because we're using that function I talked about where we save and restore, uh, I'm sorry, where we translate the uh, coordinate system, we want to save the context here. So g2.save, whoops, I'm not sure why NetBeans doesn't show the save, so we'll put that in there. I know that's good. And then uh, now, I changed the number of sides here because the polygons are more interesting when you get more sides. So basically we'll just add a line to change the number of sides. So num size. Now this is already done at the top of the method that we're editing, but we're just going to do it again here and overwrite it with a different value. So this is going to be math dot floor and then math dot random again and I have just found that this is good now you can change this yourself to whatever value you want uh, if you think about it carefully so we'll talk about that here so what I found works nice is to use math.random times 10 that gives me a number from a uh, floor of math.random times 10 which gives me a number from 0 to 9 and then I'll add 3 to it and so uh, if you think about it the minimal polygon is 3 and uh, basically uh, that means that I can have from 3 to 12 here for the number of sides and um, that works pretty good for smaller ones you could up this a bit if you wanted to uh, you could also like make this work with the size. So instead of setting the value this way as a constant range, I could look at what the user had set for the side and use that. But I find that this works pretty good. Okay, now we want to call our polygon function that we saw on the slide. Let me move up here and get my typing point in the middle of the screen. So polygon, and then uh, the parameters for that are uh, we pass the context in which is g2 and then the center point which is x and y and then uh, the radius and the number of sides so radius and num sides whoops see I made a typo there you gotta type it correctly and then this needs a semicolon here okay so now we're going to have to write the code for that polygon method. So up here, where uh, I call my, uh, where the hell is this? There we go. Where I call the arc, that method is given for us in the JavaScript library. But we had to write our own method for polygon, so I have to put that code in. Let me finish this up before we do that. I want to restore. Oops the context. Okay, so g2.restore and let me just check my printed code to make sure yes and then I just want to fill and stroke the polygon. So then g2.fill will fill the polygon with the random fill color 
and then G2 dot stroke will draw the edge with the random uh, stroke color. And then we need a break here at the end of uh, this case. Okay? All right, so that's all done. Now we need to come down here and put in our method. And this is kind of a lot of typing. And so you want to get it uh, correct. So this is going to be function. Oops, sorry. Function polygon. And then in parentheses, we'll have our list. So we're going to have context. And then the X and the Y for the center. And then the radius. And uh, let's see, what was the other one? Num sides. Num sides. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and start the function body with an opening curly brace. This is a character that's up over top of your enter key. And then when you hit enter and go to the next line, NetBeans closes that. So we want to have the function body like that. And we're going to type all of the function code into uh, the body. So formally, we call what I just typed the signature for the function or the heading, which describes what the function uses. And what we're going to type now is the body of the function, which is the code for it. Okay, now let me find the code in my uh, printout here so I make sure that I get everything right. And I think it's better for you to type the code because then you have some chance of learning it and understanding it. But uh, in the event that uh, you can't get it correct, you can just go ahead and use the download for tomorrow and that will have working code in it. Okay. All right. I'm having some trouble finding the code for some reason here in the printout because I've got the print of the entire application here. So let's see. Here we go. Ah, sorry about that. Uh, let me just go ahead and pause the video here, and uh, I'll get my code, and then we'll continue. Well, I'm sorry about that. Sometimes I'm an absent-minded wizard here, and I just had some trouble finding the code. So uh, we're ready to go now. Again, we're going to do our polygon. So we're going to go context dot, and then uh, begin path, and uh, that's going to uh, be important because then we can use close path to finish the polygon off and draw the last segment. So contacts begin path. And then we're going to go ahead and calculate our angle. So bar angle equals, uh, should be math.pi, yep, math.pi. divided by the number of sides. By the way, you can see that this is we, we wouldn't want this to be zero because that would throw an error when we divide by zero. <clears throat> so that's one of the reasons that we uh, add a, something to the elements uh, when we randomize them. So, so we get a range that's going to give us valid values. Okay, we're going to need uh, variables for our vertex x and y. So var vertex and vert y semicolon. <coughs> Excuse me. And okay, so now we're going to do the translation. So we'll say context dot translate x. Y. And so what that does is that says make X and Y the new origin. And so now when I say 0, 0, it's referring to the center uh, point of X, Y. So I've changed the coordinate system. And so then I can go ahead now and move to the first point. So I say context.move to 
and then um, radius zero. And remember, I got a little confused about that. So basically, that means that with the y on, uh, equal to zero, you're on the y-axis. So we're moving due east to the right. And that's going to be the first point or vertex of the figure. So <clears throat> we have to move the location there. And then when we start drawing, the first time we draw, it'll be from there. So now let's start. We're going to have a for loop. And uh, basically, we'll say for var, and we'll use v for vertex here. So var, and then uh, v, whoops, got to set v. I forgot about that. We want v to equal 1 because basically computer scientists count from 0. So we've got the first point already there. We moved to it, and that's point 0. This is going to be point 1. And then uh, through n, where n is the number of sides. Okay, so you'll see that. So basically, v will start at 1, and we want to draw as long as v is less than num sides. And then we want to increment v each time by uh, 1. So v plus plus means add 1 to v. Okay, all right, I'll create a body for my for loop, hit enter. So I've got that, and now all the code here will be inside the loop. So inside the loop, the first thing I want to do is calculate the vert x and the vert y. So vert x equals, and then I'll take my radius, which never changes, times math dot cosine. And then uh, the value I want to use in here is going to be angle times V, okay? Let me get this in and we'll come and look at it again, all right? Now I'm going to cheat a little bit and copy the line because the next one's real similar. So control C to copy, control V to paste. I'll change this to vert Y. I'll change my method from cosine to sine, which is S-I-N. And then that's it. Everything's the same. Okay, so now watch what happens here. So again, we calculated our angle. And then this number is going to increase starting at 1. And the next time through the loop, it'll be 2, 3, etc. As long as it's less than the number of sides. So we already have the first point. This is going to calculate the next point. And it'll take the angle times 1. So this is going to be the cosine of the angle. The next time it'll be the cosine of 2 times the angle. Then the cosine of 3 times the angle, etc. So I'm moving that segment around the circle each time, starting at this eastern point. Move to the first, second, third, etc. Finally, I move to the last one. And then as I do that, I'm going to draw. So uh, as I when I draw, I move to the point that I draw to. So it's going to always start where it left off and draw from that vertex to the next one. So now we'll do that. So context dot line two, and then this is going to be vert x, vert y. Context line two vertex vert y, and that's the end of the loop. I'll go ahead and get rid of that extra line that I have there and close the body up. Okay, so now basically what I have is I've got a polygon with one final segment left to draw, and it turns out that the context dot close path does that for me. So that will draw the line, draw from last. Vertex to first. So that'll close the figure up. Okay? And I think that's all of the code here. Hopefully I'm not going to uh, get an evil surprise, as we say. So let's go ahead now and test this and see. Real quickly, I just want to check. This should be the end of the polygon. It is. And then you can see that's small enough that I can tell that it matches. So I always just check my braces and make sure I have everything else.
Here's the color function I have. Uh, we looked at that before, I believe. That takes the RGB value and builds a color string, which is a kind of pain in the ass that the uh, uh, <clears throat> canvas coding requires. So it has to have the color in a certain format. Okay, what are we going to do now? We're going to test it. So let's go ahead, do that. We'll click our start here. And what's going on? Um, I wonder if it's open already. No, that's weird. Okay, let me just go ahead and set this. Firefox. There it goes. Okay. All right, so I can see the polygon. I'm just going to go ahead and set the polygon. Uh, I'll just leave everything default. And uh, there we go. So it looks like I've got something wrong in the code here. Let's see what's going on there. Looks like it's not going around all the way. <laughs> that's pretty interesting okay let me go ahead and uh, break off for a minute I'll figure out what's going on here and I'll... so this is pretty funny after explaining how all this worked to you I made a mistake and I wonder if you caught it or not if you see up here where I'm calculating the angle I'm dividing math pi divided by the number of sides but that's half a circle it should be two times math pi or two pi so two times math pi that corrects the code and now we should be able to tell now think about what we saw we saw that it was drawing half circles really half polygons right so there we are all right so let's go ahead and do polygon again again we'll just do the default and now we're getting our polygons so you can see that we have different uh, numbers of sides there okay Alrighty, so uh, that's really good for today. And, uh, you know, I made a few mistakes, but instead of like editing them out of the video, I left them in. I want you to see how we do this process. So when I looked at things, I had made a few mistakes, but I was able to figure out and debug them. And a lot of times it's pretty straightforward to use just logic. So you saw that I could see what I did wrong. When I went back and looked at my code, then I remembered, ah, yes, it should be 2 pi. So I really hope you're enjoying everything. Uh, again, if you have trouble getting the code together, do what you can. But if you don't get it, we'll give you a copy of this code uh, when you start tomorrow. So, you know, try to figure it out how to do it. All right. Take care. I'll see you tomorrow.